to Lions, Giants, and Bears, Trusting God in Times of Fear. My name is Cassie Waits, and I'm so glad that you're part of our class today. In the shadow of COVID-19, we are being plagued by a second virus, a virus called fear. And while some fear is normal and healthy, all too often fear can overwhelm us overtake us and crowd out the abundant joy that life in Christ offers. In this five-week series, we are studying fear, how scripture speaks to our fears, and the reassurances that God offers us during these times. As we begin our time together, let's open with prayer. Let us pray. Holy God, thank you for this day and for this chance to gather, to study your word and apply it to our lives. Let your spirit move in our hearts this morning to open us to your teaching and fill us with your spirit of power and love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Last week was week one of our study and we covered physical fears. We read the story of David and Goliath, and we reflected on what it would mean to lean into God's faithfulness and deliverance as we face our own trials. This week, we are turning our attention to the fear of not having enough. We're going to read several passages of scripture of people who were in desperate situations, and we will find that over and over again, scripture assures us that our God is a God who provides. Before we dig into the scripture, let's take a moment and reflect on this question. When have you feared not having enough? I wonder what you all came up with for this. I know this question of, of a fear of not having enough is really timely for me because every time I go to the grocery store, there are entire shelves that are empty. And so every time I'm looking for staples that just aren't there. And if I find them, I think it's a miracle. And then, and then of course I buy way more than I need because I'm afraid it won't be there again. This fear also works itself out in, in kind of silly ways. Because I have young kids and because my husband and I are both have full-time jobs, we are always juggling the children's schedules and our schedules. And so I have an underlying fear that I do not have enough babysitters in my phone contact list. As we look at our lives, we begin to recognize these fears of not having enough, they pop up everywhere. And sometimes they're, they're even silly, we know they're silly, but we can't help it. It's a worry and it, it, it's in the back of our mind and it just keeps popping up. This is the, the danger of letting this kind of fear get out of control. It turns into long-term worry. It may even turn into anxiety. In his bestseller, Fearless, Max Lucado connects this fear of not having enough with the propensity we have to worry and to be anxious. And so his go-to scripture, the way he finds comfort and reassurance when it comes to worry is Matthew chapter six, where Jesus, in the middle of his Sermon on the Mount, he teaches about worry. Let's take a look. Matthew chapter six, verses 25 to 27. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? In this teaching, Jesus reminds his followers not to let their worries consume their thoughts. He reminds them, do not worry about what you will eat. Do not worry about what you will wear. Look at creation and look at how God feeds and clothes it. 
how much more will God take care of you? And this is not just a beautiful sentiment, but this is a theological claim backed up by centuries of God's faithfulness to God's people. Jesus can say these words because God has proven time and again to be a God who provides. And we know that God is a God who provides because we can look throughout Scripture and see instances of this. The first story, big story we come to, is the story of Exodus where God provides manna for the Israelites in the wilderness. But God's provision does not stop there. In fact, we see in a couple of places where God works through prophets to provide for those in need. And so let's see how much we remember. It's time for our first pop quiz. Through which two prophets does God multiply food in the Old Testament? A. Elisha and Elijah, B. Isaiah and Ezekiel, or C. Hosea and Amos? If you answered A, you would be correct. Elijah and Elisha are two prophets through whom God works to feed people who are hungry. In the case of Elijah, we know Elijah is a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. He is not in good favor with the king and the queen there, and so he goes into hiding. God actually calls him to go into hiding. And so Elijah ends up in a little town called Zarephath where he meets up with a widow and her son who are on the brink of starvation when he encounters them. But he joins with them, becomes part of their family, and for the whole time that he stays with her, God works through him to ensure that their meal jar never runs out. This is a miracle recorded in 1 Kings chapter 17, and it's associated with Elijah, but it's really pointing back to how God provides through Elijah. Elisha has a miracle of even greater proportions recorded in 2 Kings chapter 4. And this is a very brief story, but it goes like this. There was a, a servant who brings Elisha 20 loaves of barley bread, and it's supposed to feed 100 people. This is not nearly enough food to feed that many people. And Elisha says, feed it to the people. The servant says, there's not enough here. Elisha says, do it anyway, because the Lord has told me that there will be leftovers. And if at this point you're thinking that story sounds really familiar, it's because we see something very similar happen in the life of Jesus. Matthew 14, 13 to 21. Now, when Jesus heard this, that is that John the Baptist had been beheaded, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This story of Jesus feeding the 5,000 is a miracle story. And as we read it, we recognize the connections back to the story of Elisha. Now, Elisha has 100 people to feed and 20 loaves of bread, but the stakes are even higher in this gospel story. We have 5,000 people and we have only five loaves of bread. And the disciples look around, they recognize that the time is getting late, there is no food, and they tell Jesus, they say, send these people home because there is no food and they are hungry. And Jesus turns to them and he says words that, that I'm sure just cut to the heart of their, of their fear of not having enough. And he turns to them and he says, you feed them. 
And I want to pause on that statement for a minute. I don't think that Jesus really expected them to have a solution to this problem. But I do think that he voices, he voices the fear that lives inside of us when we worry about not having enough. The fear is you feed them. The fear is, okay, Cassie, how are you going to take care of this situation? How are you going to fix it, solve it? That is the root of this fear of not having enough. And that is why it conflicts with a posture of faith because a posture of faith says, I don't need to have all the answers. I don't need to have planned for every contingency. I'm trusting that God is ultimately in control of my life and is ultimately in control of what is happening. And I'm going to trust that it's in God's hands. But the fear of not having enough says, you feed them. You figure it out. You do it alone. You do it on your own. Let's pause and reflect here. When have you felt the pressure to, quote, feed them yourselves? Fortunately for us, the story does not end with those words. The disciples, whether they knew where Jesus was going with this or not, they play along with this game. And they say, okay, you want us to feed these people. Let me show you how paltry our resources are. Think about this. 5,000 people. And we've got five loaves of bread and two fish. And it's like the disciples hold this up and say, we told you. There's no McDonald's. There's nowhere for us to buy the food. Even if, even if we could find a Kroger, it's going to cost six months of wages for us to afford enough food for this many people. And that's what we read in the Gospel of John. But what we find out here is that it doesn't matter that they don't have enough food. It doesn't matter that they don't have enough money because they give this to what they have to Jesus and this is what happens Next, Jesus receives this paltry amount of food. He blesses it and distributes it. And then he asks the disciples to participate one more time in this, in this whole event. He asks that they go around and collect the leftovers. Now, I don't know about you, but I can do the math. If there are 5,000 people and five loaves of bread and two fish, there are aren't going to be any leftovers to collect. And so I commend the disciples for hanging in this long while they, they have to be scratching their heads wondering, where is Jesus going with this? But they do as he asks, and when all, the, all of it's, everything's accounted for, they've got baskets upon baskets of leftovers. This is the promise that I see in the story. When we offer whatever insufficient paltry resources that we have, when we offer those to Jesus, they become enough. When we trust what we have to God, it becomes enough. Not because we had enough to begin with, but because God's resources and God's creativity are unlimited. And that's especially important, I think, in this time, in these days, that we remember we don't have to have all the resources. We don't have to have all the support. We don't have to have everything figured out. We don't have to consider ourselves the ones completely in charge of this. I mean, we don't have to ask ourselves that question every day. How are you going to feed them? We can trust what we do have 
to God and we can trust that God will make it enough. And the good news just keeps on coming because what we know is that when we trust what little we have to God, God not only makes it enough, but there are always abundant leftovers. This is what it means to live from a posture of faith rather than a posture of fear. It means that when we take stock, when we take stock of the things that we lack, we also rest our trust, not in our own ability to take care of the situation, but in God's unlimited ability to take care of us. As we close today, let's consider one final question. When you have trusted God with your needs, how has God provided abundantly?